I'm Harriet Vance Ball, Associate Professor of Medicine from McMaster University, and I'm absolutely honored and delighted to welcome Dr. Deepak Bhatt, Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School today. Hello, Deepak. Great to be with you again. We are live at ACC 2021, where Dr. Bhatt presented his secondary analyses of the SCORED and SOLOIST trials assessing the efficacy of soda gliflozin across the range of left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, Dr. Butt, why don't you start by telling us um, the rationale for this work in the context of the findings of soloist and SCORED? Absolutely. Well, both the soloist and SCORED trials studied the SGLT2 inhibitor of soda gliflozin though more specifically, it's actually a dual SGLT1 and SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitors, of course, leading to enhanced glucose excretion in the urine, SGLT1 inhibition, reducing levels of postprandial glucose via an action in the gut. So SGLT2 in the kidney, SGLT1 in the gut. There's also some SGLT1 in the kidney as well. So that's what sodagliflozin is. It was studied in two large trials called Soloist and SCORE. In fact, I'd presented both as late breakers at the American Heart Association last year, and both the main findings and main papers were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Soloist enrolled patients with worsening heart failure or who were admitted for worsening heart failure, initially stabilized and then randomized to sodagliflozin or placebo, about half of them in the hospital, about the other half in the next three days after discharge. SCORED, on the other hand, enrolled patients with diabetes, but uh, stable uh, patients who had chronic kidney disease. So Solist was mostly sick inpatient type patients with diabetes and heart failure, uh, all of whom had heart failure. It could have been heart failure of any sort. SCORED consisted of patients with diabetes and CKD outpatients, some of whom had a history of heart failure, some of whom didn't, but we had ejection fractions in the majority of all of these patients at baseline. So what I just presented at ACC was an analysis looking at the pooled patient level data from these two trials and the effects of sodagliflozin across the full range of measured ejection fraction at baseline. Right, so why don't you tell us about your main findings? Sure, so the primary endpoint was the composite of total cardiovascular deaths, hospitalizations for heart failure and urgent heart failure visits. That endpoint was positive for both soloist and scored individually and therefore of course it was positive for the pooled analysis. What was interesting though, I thought was as we looked across the full range of measured ejection fraction in the entire population over 11,000 patients across their baseline ejection fraction. Again, these are patients, some of whom had a history of heart failure, some of whom uh, didn't have a history of heart failure. There were significant uh, benefits, consistent benefits, robust benefits in that endpoint in those with an EF less than 40, EF of 40 to 50 or EF greater than 50%. And that then does include those patients with a preserved ejection fraction, but that's the overall population. Again, some of them had heart failure, some didn't. So then if we look specifically at the 4,500 or so patients that had a history of heart failure, that same relationship exists. That is a significant benefit of sodagliflozin versus placebo on the endpoint I mentioned in HEFREF, uh, heart failure with the mid-range ejection fraction, and now also a significant benefit in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What proportion of patients with heart failure were ambulatory? Sure, so from uh, the patients in SCORE, they were all ambulatory because they were all outpatients. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, for the um, HEFPEF analyses, you know, there were about 250 or so patients from Solist with HEFPEF. And there, in fact, there was also a significant, in our pre-specified stratified look at the data, significant uh, reduction in the primary endpoint in those with heart failure preserved ejection fraction. You know, rightly so, some uh, physicians said, well, you know, that's a relatively modest size subgroup. Uh, is that really enough to change practice or believe that the finding in HEFPEF is robust? Uh, so here uh, we have examined those with heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So as I mentioned, there are about 4,500 patients Overall, if we look now at those with an ejection fraction greater than or equal to 15%, that's 1,930 or so patients. Mm 
uh, about a thousand females, about eight or nine hundred males in those with HEFPEF. And, and there, I'd say it's a pretty robust uh, sample size now, uh, adding the two trials together, uh, we see that there are significant benefits still. So it's not that it was just the sort of sicker or soulless patients that were driving it. The majority of patients in this analysis actually are from SCORB. Okay, yeah, that's that was my um, question. So these findings can be applied to people uh, regardless of NYHA class because you had a good proportion of ambulatory patients and um, hospitalized patients. Um, yes. Tell us about your sex specific analysis. Sure. Well, uh, as you are aware, and, and likely much of the audience is aware, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a problem just in general, but it's a particular problem in older women uh, where the prevalence can be quite high. And that's been seen in many registry studies uh, and some trial populations as well. And it can be a, a real issue. And overall in HEFPEF, there aren't really any totally proven therapies to date. I mean, there are some that are approved or on the road to approval, but, but you know, no trial that actually showed a, a significant uh, uh, reduction in endpoints in HEFPEF until SOLIST, uh, albeit uh, in a subgroup there of SOLIST. Uh, and now with this pooled analysis, I'd say a bit of a more robust sample size are showing that. So you know, there's a huge unmet need in, in, in HEFPEF. Uh, and that's uh, you know, particularly true, I think, in older women. And in this analysis of folks with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it ends up there are about 1,050 or so women and about 900 or so, or a little shy of 900 uh, men. And there were consistent benefits in each of those subgroups. Uh, the interaction p-value, which is the right way of looking at subgroups, of course, was non-significant, meaning that the benefits were consistent in each of those two subgroups. And well, I don't personally favor looking at p-values and subgroups, but rather consistency and directionality. I mean, that's the right way of doing it. But for you know people that do like to do that sort of thing, uh, for what it's worth, the p-value even within women was less than 0.05 as a subgroup uh, with HEFPEF. So, you know, I think it provides uh, really reassuring data that the overall findings apply to both men and women with respect to benefits of SGLT2 inhibition in HEFPEF. Right, and the overall effect estimates um, and the risk reduction was driven by a reduction in heart failure, hospitalization, and decompensation? Uh, yes, I mean, we examined the composite of CV death and hospitalization for heart failure and urgent heart failure visits and total events. Though in the overall trial findings, we had shown consistent benefits uh, in each of those different components, uh, not significant for CV death, uh, in either of the individual trials. Though, uh, interestingly, in this uh, pooled analysis, the uh, CV death uh, in our on-treatment analysis actually is significant. I think it would have been significant in the intent to treat, but as you may recall, both these trials ended sooner than we wanted to uh, because of a lack of funding at the onset of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the uh, company sponsor of the trials uh, basically ran out of money and uh, was unable to raise more money and was unable to keep funding the trials. But uh, fortunately, the drug effect was strong enough. Both trials were, were still quite positive, but that did hurt the power of secondary endpoints or components of the primary endpoints, such as cardiovascular death. But in the on-treatment analyses, uh, which look at patients who actually were randomized to the study drug and worse on treatment, uh, that is not patients who discontinued for whatever reason, I uh, can discontinue either a drug or a placebo. You know, there, there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death. And I'll point out as well in the overall trial, there was no significant difference in discontinuation rates or adherence rates uh, uh, for the drug versus the placebo. So I don't think it's one of those cases where sometimes on treatment analyses, you know, uh, can be a bit biased because obviously if a drug is causing lots of side effects, well, then the intent to treat may not look good because a lot of the patients are legitimately stopping the drug because they're having a bad side effect. You know, here the side effect overall um, rate was uh, uh, really, I'd say, identical to the placebo. Uh, so I think here what we're seeing is in the patient who is adherent um, and um, uh, is thereby potentially getting the benefit of the drug, we see there is a very robust benefit in the drug. Uh, no, I was going to raise that point, and I'm glad you preemptively stopped me. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, as much as um, there are issues with multiple testing, the findings were consistent 
throughout most of the subgroups and across the range of EF and this patient population of heart failure um, and diabetes. Now, did you look at EGFR at all or is that coming up? Yeah, we've got to do a lot more uh, detailed dives of uh, renal function. You know, we've got some great nephrologists uh, in, our, in our group that are going to do that. But uh, you know, what I presented at AHA did show, at least in terms of glycemic control, uh, mm -hmm. benefits across the full range of eGFR, which is important for SGLT2 inhibitors because when the GFR gets low enough, while they do still have cardiovascular benefit, uh, as has been shown in other trials, their ability to lower glucose is markedly diminished. Uh, unlike this drug that we studied, sodagliflozin, which I think because of the SGLT1 gut-related uh, inhibition, uh, still produces a significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C, even when the GFR says you know, uh, less than 30. So I think you know, that's a differentiating feature, but in terms of actual clinical outcomes as a function of GFR, that wasn't part of this analysis. Right, so in this pooled analysis of SCORD and soloist comprising diabetic patients who were ambulatory with chronic kidney disease or hospitalized patients with heart failure, you found that sodagliflozin uh, reduced the risk of the primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, worsening heart failure in patients with heart failure. Um, what are your take home points for clinicians? How can they apply the results of your study to practice? Yeah, it's a great question. I guess it's the bottom line. So first of all, this drug, as of the time that you and I are speaking, is investigational. Uh, the company that uh, is responsible for it now uh, has announced that they're going to file for FDA approval in that process. We're you know, uh, doing analyses and trying to get things together to formally submit to the FDA. But uh, regardless of the fate of that uh, deliberation, and I'm hopeful it will result in a approved drug here in the US and hopefully Canada and worldwide. But, but uh, regardless of that, I think a lot of what we learned in uh, both of these trials and in this pooled analysis does apply to the class of SGLT2 inhibitors, namely that SGLT2 inhibitors work in patients with diabetes across the full range of ejection fraction, including heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And as you know, trials are ongoing with other SGLT2 inhibitors, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin specifically, in HEFPEF and including populations without diabetes. So that'll be important information in particular in those patients without diabetes. But I'd say, I I'm thinking those trials will be positive, we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in the patient with diabetes with any form of heart failure, first of all, they probably have a good reason to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor anyway. They probably got some degree of chronic kidney disease or, or other reasons they should be on it. But now there's really even great, uh, a greater push, I would say, based on these data for uh, patients with diabetes and any form of heart failure, male or female, to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. And who would you not offer this therapy to? I would only not afford, uh, avail it to folks who can't afford it. Uh, at least in the US, that's a bit of an issue in terms of access still. And I imagine in many regions of the world, depending on on the healthcare system set up, and it's gonna be still a good few years before uh, generics are widely available in this drug class. Uh, so that's probably the biggest obstacle, at least uh, around where I am. But uh, putting that aside, just to answer your question uh, clinically or scientifically, uh, I would only not use SGLT2 inhibitors in patients who have diabetes who have contraindications to their use. So for example, you know, folks that have frequent mycotic genital infections, that might not be a good patient. Uh, to use SGLT2 inhibitors on because that's a side effect. You know, as far as really sick inpatients, probably, you know, best not to though. In soloist, stabilized uh, heart failure patients, you know, there it performed quite safely. And more recently in a totally separate trial, uh, DARE-19, looking at dapagliflozin in COVID uh, patients, there uh, in sick patients, it seemed to be reasonably safe as well. Mm -hmm. But um, still, you know, I think there's some degree of caution in the critically ill patient in, in starting this type of drug. Type 1 diabetics, I know this is uh, offered to patients in Europe, but type 1 diabetics in North America? Well, that's a great question. So you're right, sodagliflozin specifically is approved in Europe by the European Medicines Agency, though it wasn't ever commercialized for that. Uh, hopefully it will be. But uh, for patients with uh, type 1 diabetes as an adjunct to insulin, 
Um, so, you know, Sotica flows in specifically does seem uh, good and safe in that, but really what I'm talking about in general for the SGLT2 inhibitor class uh, pertains right. to those with type two diabetes. Uh, and um, there, I think, especially if chronic kidney disease and or heart failure are present, heart failure of any flavor, I think there's a very strong reason to use an SGLT2 inhibitor. And even in patients with diabetes without either of those sorts of things, if they can afford it, uh, it seems like a really great class of drugs to be using. GLP-1 agonists as well. It wasn't you know, our topic today to discuss, but you know, that also is a class with great data, but also can be expensive. Right, possibly less so for heart failure prevention, but uh, uh, lots of research to come. I thank you so much for joining me this morning. It was such a delight to see you again, and congratulations on another great um, trial analysis, and I look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you so much. Great seeing you too.